Hello, and welcome to the Emergency Preparedness Guide from Blue Horse Threat Mitigation Strategies. I'm Robert, and the purpose of this guide is to help you prepare for nearly any emergency or disaster and to keep you, your family, business, church, or organization safe, secure, and operational through the tough times that we sometimes face. Most of us have at least considered being prepared for events, whether it means having an umbrella near the door for when it rains, or having a well-stocked spare vehicle at an alternate location for a quick escape to a secure fortress on a foreboding mountain. Just kidding, right? Maybe not. Maybe you, your family, your social organization, maybe the members of your church have expressed some concern over the current global pandemic situation and the potential fallout from their response. Maybe you consider yourself safe and secure, but you have family members that live in a crowded metropolitan area where they aren't as safe and secure as you would wish they were. So emergency preparedness means doing something in the present to avoid, prevent, mitigate, or ride out some unknown negative event in the future. It is a process that is never finished, constantly updated, upgraded, upfitted, broken, repaired, used, worn out, expired, revised, replaced, outmoded, thrown away, and restarted. It is a cycle that once began and taken seriously is never sufficient or complete. It'll generate a list of needs and wants that becomes a bulleted list within a bulleted list within a bulleted list and so on. Now I'm going to say this phrase a lot. Keep in mind. Okay, because there's a lot here to keep in mind. I'd suggest taking notes. That this presentation starts out in the larger scale from a government or big business perspective and then we'll drop down from the 30,000 foot level to put our feet back on the ground and take a look at how we get from lost in a hostile environment with a homemade knife to having multiple options and resources and the knowledge to quickly and decisively make informed decisions that will keep you safe. All right, so who am I? Uh, I'm a retired police patrol officer with more than 28 years of police patrol experience. Uh, not behind a desk, not a cushy 7-ish to whenever I want to leave workday. I'm talking rotating shifts, midnights, overtime, part-time, missing birthdays, working Christmas, ride-alongs on our anniversary, and all that jazz. Working on 9-11 and spending the next 19 years trying to help prevent anything like that from happening again through intense training all over the country and then teaching others. As my department's Homeland Security Unit Supervisor, uh, creating and delivering in-depth meaningful training for officers to take to the streets. I challenged my supervisors and peers to take emergency preparedness seriously. To some degree, they did. So after retiring, uh, my experience garnered me a position as an analyst for the U.S. Senate's Office of Emergency Preparedness, where I was able to design emergency preparedness and uh, safety instructional material to deliver to over 600 congressional members and staff, including respiratory protection, emergency action plans and response to active threats. That's in the nation's most at-risk city and one of its, for one of its most threatened populations. So later, working as an exercise preparedness coordinator for FEMA, uh, serving the executive branch and the interagency, I was involved in coordinating over 60 agencies and more than 500 participants uh, for both national level and global level continuity exercises. And it's interacting with all levels of experience, commitment, and interest, not just continuity, but exercise and evaluation as well. So I still have miles to go and tons more to learn, hopefully from those who view this video and they'll provide some constructive and helpful criticism, which I welcome. I would be remiss if I, and negligent if I didn't point to FEMA, despite the negative associations with, their, with the acronym. Uh, they have top-notch personnel who work tirelessly to keep this nation safe. Uh, my desire is that someone gets the information that we're looking for and it makes them more confident in their ability to survive and overcome whatever disruption in quotes, comes their way. All right, let's get into this. Emergency preparedness in a nutshell. What we can do with what we have, when we need to, in the environment we find ourselves in. So that statement right there should be written down in all caps, underlined, and highlighted. It encapsulates the emergency preparedness concept. So nearly each capitalized word in this slide has an industry size depth to it. Preparedness encompasses the entire emergency response spectrum pre, during, and post-emergency. Think about it this way. A fighter doesn't wait until after the fight to learn how to recover, right? They prepare through knowledge, training, and practice. They evaluate their performance and then plan how to improve, train some more, apply the new skills, evaluate again, rinse and repeat, right? 
So it's what we can do, that's our current capabilities, with what we have, that's our current resources. When we need to, now, tomorrow, in one year, two years, five years, under varying and progressively complex and difficult circumstances, in, in the environment we find ourselves in, where we are specifically, and more likely a degraded environment. So preparedness is what we do. That which we do, preparing, determines what we can do. So in keeping it in the present tense, it helps to define our, our current capabilities, what we're capable of, it, of at this moment. What we do, we accomplish with what we have. Those things that might serve us in an emergency occurring right now. So personally, and this is my own metric, concerning critical resources. This means it should be within one minute's movement or reach. Now, that's not a government-defined requirement. Actually, we all know in certain certain situations, one second can be a lifetime, uh, and, and 59 seconds just goes by too fast sometimes. If you think of it in terms of a tornado, you might get a warning, and you'll definitely hear it, but what if it happens in the middle of the night? How much response time do you have? The environment we are in during the emergency may not be the one we prepared ourselves to be in. The what, meaning the equipment and resources, although well thought out, packed and ready, may be two floors below us and five doors down the hall away. The environment will dictate the level of your preparedness efforts. Your home will usually end up being better prepared than your office. Your emergency sheltering area inside your home might be better prepared than the rest of your home. This line of reasoning leads us to a relationship of effort levels. Think of how much gear your vehicle can carry. You probably couldn't put all that in a backpack, right? Everything in your backpack isn't going with you to the office or the committee meeting, is it? Likewise, you, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't consider your entire survival package to consist of just a Leatherman tool to get you out of the metropolis and 50 miles away to your mountain cabin. Your efforts and formats need to be tied together and complement each other. The most personal level of, of emergency preparedness, that's emergency preparedness every day, or everyday carry, also known as EDC, is a popular subject with an endless variety of pocket and belt tools. So EDC, it's typically what might be considered to some, by some, to be the absolute minimum of emergency preparedness. A Leatherman tool might be all you carry. It might be a section of your purse that has pepper spray, maybe even a small firearm, a battery charger, and a couple of other small necessities. Your EDC efforts and accoutrements don't have to be exclusive of your larger, more intensive and extensive preparedness efforts. They should work together. And if we look at these, let's call them formats of being prepared from a different perspective, we can see a path starting to take form. All right, let's get into this. All right, so consider uh, your sleep and being at what might be our most vulnerable. We're usually minimally clothed or best we have on something that hardly serves any purpose at all other than making sure we are recovered if we have to wander into the kitchen late at night, right? So you could sleep with a knife or a gun under your pillow, but that has its own inherently unsafe problems that require a high degree of discipline, training, and commitment. However, you can keep a weapon in a container near your bed, one that requires minimal but concentrated effort to get into. So this could be your plan. Immediately upon being wakened by maybe a suspicious noise, you get a weapon into your hand, all right? One that can be used uh, easily at close to medium range. That would be the one next to your bed, all right? So you're awake, your senses are alert, but no actual problem is presenting itself yet, okay? You think you heard something. Now you can get your bearings. You can grab your phone and prepare to call 911 and get anyone else up and ready for action. So under the immediate protection of your initial weapon and now with a partner, you can move to your next most advantageous position, which might be your backpack across the room. So when you reach the backpack and maybe a better weapon system nearby, you either trade off weapons or trade up, increasing your firepower and your posture. Now, realizing it was only an earthquake, you stand down the weapons, keeping them with you, and realize the gas line has erupted. Increasing your momentum, you grab your pre-placed and well-marked essentials and head to the vehicle, where power sources and cell connection will be up and running as you travel. You know there are emergency food rations in the vehicle and you, you take the route that you planned earlier that might suffer the least amount of damage in the event of an earthquake and head to your brother's house where you keep a packed suitcase with clothing, toiletries, cash, and copies of important documents. Arriving at your brother's house though, you see, a, you see the prearranged signal he left indicating that he's gone on to the alternate site and has your items. So we could keep going on the write your own adventure thing, but Let's stop there. So 
that's one way to use these preparation formats from everyday carry to a small backpack to a one day backpack or a go bag or to a three day backpack and a vehicle completely prepared for a week to get you to that site that might support you for one month or more. All of these formats can be tied together and complement each other and they should with some planning and of course trial and error. So beginning your preparedness journey cannot happen soon enough. All right, but just like a journey, you have to know where you are, where you're going, and how you're going to get there. All right, so we'll go over the steps in detail. Just be prepared to invest deliberate time into these steps. Okay, so as one who's attempted to be as prepared as possible, it seems as if you never have enough of the right stuff at the right time. And afterwards, meaning after the emergency is over, and it's rarely over, over. So emergency preparedness efforts don't stop. The after action report, you may have heard of something like that. It comes at the end of an actual emergency or maybe an exercise. And it's a compendium of things done right, things done wrong, and things not done at all, and everything in between. And that process can be nearly as difficult as the emergency or exercise. So people, teams, organizations, and leaders have to be brutally honest with their partners, their shareholders, stakeholders, and especially themselves. It involves taking ownership of mistakes and shortcomings and diligently seeking to take corrective measures. So the improvement or the corrective action plan, the IP or the CAP, this can be as simple as we need to color the launch switches so we don't make that mistake again. And as complex as a multi-volume congressional report taking years to complete. So the AAR and the CAP essentially bracket the end of one event in preparation for the next. All right, emergency preparedness inside the nutshell. Okay. And yes, this is me reading directly from the slide. So capabilities, resources, and environment. All right. So capabilities, these are actions, processes, and systems that in total contribute singly or together to your overall survival. Okay. Resources, anything that is needed to carry out your capabilities, i.e. food, gasoline, shelter, personnel, a sister agency, department, division, or team, internet service, and your environment. As small as your personal space, as large as the physical geographical boundaries that surround you. Your initial environment is your primary location. It is assumed to be, initially, safe, 100% operational, and that's not counting daily hiccups and current fixes, and fully staffed. Impacts to any one of the three categories above will likely begin the continuity recovery response, which is the typical process that follows after implementing your emergency preparedness actions. Okay, changes in both capabilities and resources will generally lead to a change of your environment. Nearly every emergency, the environment changes. Okay, the exception to this are when people are the problem, but there is a caveat to it, like home invaders, marauders, bandits, etc. Bandits. Most natural disasters affect and change the environment to the degree that your working location cannot be used efficiently. This in turn can and usually does affect your capabilities and your resources. So start getting used to the term primary, alternate, contingency, and emergency. A good start is to think of your primary location as the place you usually work. And we'll talk about this later. Right, plan for continuity, preparedness, or survival? Which one? The terms continuity, preparedness, and survival are, most often, synonymous, but differ in application when focusing on specific efforts. Continuity, being able to do what you are doing now in a degraded environment, typically applies to an organization or process. Preparedness, efforts geared toward ensuring continuity and survival. Survival, exactly what it means to continue living. To what degree? Better or worse? Yeah. That depends on our next one. Continuity. Continuity means putting redundancy or redundant systems and or resources in place. An example, purchasing or having on hand and in good working order, backup computers for personnel to operate from in case of a computer virus. Reserving a hotel room out of town in advance of a hurricane. Uh, coordinating and arranging with an industry partner to take over critical or primary functions in case of operational damage from flooding. So continuity efforts are never ending, changing, and should be constantly tested, exercised, and evaluated at every level from personal, meaning the individual, to department, to agency, to division, and further. 
In continuity efforts at the personal, family, and small organizational levels are drastically less involved and complex than those at the government and large business level. Continuity is a process of, a, of steps in the overarching goal of getting back to normal or a return to normal. Continuity is the label for a calculated and tiered response process that can involve relocation, relocation action groups, that's my term, damage assessment, recovery efforts, reconstitution efforts, and eventually a return to normal. So what is a return to normal? Not as normal as one would believe. Normal is being prepared for any or another emergency. Emergencies are not scheduled and do not work Monday through Friday. Normal after an emergency may be drastically different than what normal was before the emergency. All right, preparedness, emergency preparedness. This involves purchasing, placing, and practicing the use of equipment and resources. You can see how it builds on the continuity um, efforts of placing resources, okay? So it also also like budget requests and approvals for, say, for example, respiratory protective equipment. You know, it's also called personal protective equipment, PPE, or determining the best placement of, or storage of, of that PPE for immediate access and use by your personnel. Creating a resource cache at a remote and accessible location, such as food or defensive equipment. Or developing an everyday carry ensemble or a go bag or a bug out bag. So preparedness also involves training, testing, and evaluating. That's TT&E. Uh, personnel, equipment, processes, and resources. Primarily, this is for checking to see if your preparations will work during, during an emergency. Who's this for? It's for organizations and any personnel turnaround or rotation will necessitate uh, scheduled, initial, recurring, and retraining as well as specific certifications. We'll talk about that. Continually assessing threats, risks, and hazardous incidents, or THIRA, T-H-I-R-A. Okay, what this involves is red teaming. Okay, that's that's a good guy, bad guy team. Okay, um, and following the results from exercise after action reports, AARs, uh, improvement plans, IPs, and corrective action plans, CAPs or CAPs. You need to consider the most likely scenario, scenario as well as the most unlikely scenario. And if we keep this in mind, the best emergency preparedness plans are simple, flexible, and understandable. Survival. Literally, the act or actions of staying alive, particularly during an emergency or in a degraded environment. In the corporate sense, viability equals survival, being able to be used efficiently. Survival. Not of the fittest. If it was all about the most fit, then every one of us would always be looking over, over our shoulder. In the context of emergency preparedness and continuity, the forward progress of our purpose, our operations, our family, and maybe humanity altogether means all who are involved working together for the good of all. It is inevitable that greed, pride, envy, and a me-first attitude will come from one quarter or another, but that has to be squashed immediately. Again, training, exercise, and evaluation will help to solidify the purpose and goals of the hard tasks ahead for the individual and groups that feel like giving up and the team member who, who now isn't sure which protagonist to follow because they don't know the value of the success of the mission. So putting it all together, in the larger picture, for the business process, community, family to survive, it needs to take steps, emergency preparedness, to ensure its ability to continue, its continuity, its purpose. That's the goal, that's the mission. To do so, they need people who are ready, prepared to survive, and that's survival. Location, destination, and transportation. This is from the slide. Um, so first you need to understand where you are right now. What are your current capabilities? If something happened in an hour or tomorrow or next week, what, what are you capable of doing without assistance? Second, what or where is your goal? What are you aiming for? How many alternate locations are you looking to have in one month, one year, maybe right now, or personnel, number of personnel or, or certain resources. Third, how do you want to get there? Is this a budget item that, that you're going to have to go through Congress to get approval for, or is this really a matter of saving some money, or is this a matter of repurposing some items that you already have um, for, that, for that survival effort?
And so understand that being prepared can be a huge undertaking. If you haven't opened the emergency preparedness box before, it will be a lot to unpack. Uh, this guide will help you on your way. The larger and more complex the organization is, as obvious as it sounds, the longer it will take to get the program off the ground. The initial assessment of your capabilities, or where are we now phase, is more than what most managers expect. Many police agencies have expressed the impression or the perspective that, that you know, we're an agency that responds to emergencies. How much more do we need to know? Or who will respond to take care of the responders? Now, a more logical but still inaccurate question would be, what do the responders do when the emergency happens to them? So one of the most important aspects of preparation for any specific emergency when the effort is a cooperative one, and most are, is coordinating between agencies or organizations. Locations, resources, and communications are among the most difficult issues to resolve between partner agencies. All right, so where are you now? Where are you physically located and where are you in your readiness posture? Your physical location, put it on a map, um, preferably one that has layers to it. That shouldn't be too hard in, in the internet environment we have today. Um, you need to look at things like elevation, um, surrounding bodies of water, prevailing winds in the area is another good, another good uh, thing to look at. Uh, if you're interested, look up downwind hazard predictions, okay, DWHPs. All right, um, let's see, where are you at in your readiness posture? How far are you along in your training, your certifications, your skills, your knowledge, the knowledge of your people? Um, are there any uh, you know, preparation tests to make sure people are qualified for certain, you know, for certain uh, processes or systems? Those are the things you need to look at. Literally and figuratively, look at your surroundings and see what the lay of the land is like. So what you're looking for are characteristics of your surroundings that benefit you, multiply your efforts and strengths, make use of efficient routes in and out of your location, and offer plenty of alternative routes. You also need to identify those characteristics that will negate your efforts, slow you down, restrict your movement, and put you in with large crowds. Even if there is a lot of negative aspects of your location, short of picking up everything and moving to a more favorable site, there are actions and decisions that, that can improve your readiness posture. Okay, so is it impossible? No, I, th I think not. Um, your, so your basic mission is to survive, and after that, everything else is a bonus, right? No, not really. There are different missions for different segments of of industry, of society, of you know the way we live. So what is your mission? That's what you have to ask. Uh, completing the mission is the goal, and if you define the mission, it it becomes you see that the mission is your task, and your mission will change as you accomplish certain tasks or more tasks are added to your mission. <clears throat> Although it seems simple, there is a difference between a mission, between mission and emergency. So example, uh, the ABC widget company, which supplies that supplies widgets to emergency responders who must have the widgets to help people impacted by disasters. There's a hurricane that's damaged the main, that's damaged the main widget factory of ABC. And ABC's mission is manufacture and deliver widgets. The emergency is a hurricane and the damage caused. Well, the emergency and damage can and will change, and the mission, for the most part, will not. So the mission here is that they need to supply emergency responders, and they have a mission of being able to respond to nearly every, every emergency, every other emergency that occurs out there. Their overall mission is to, is to prevent the loss of or safeguard human life. Definitely not impossible. Okay, your mission has everything to do with your role and setting you're in, okay, or are going to be in during a time of emergency. If you work for an agency that has placed you in a critical role concerning the organization's uh, readiness and continuity mission, you will likely be required to attend at least a few courses that have to do with how you conduct certain aspects of your personal life. Okay, you may be on call, subject to call, always on call, or on dedicated shift work. You may be required to refrain and be tested from recreational or other drug and alcohol use. Uh, this usually involves a security clearance of some type. If you find yourself in one of these critical positions, it is of utmost importance that you have your house and family well prepared as soon as possible. As a matter of fact, having your family well prepared already is can be and has been, I've seen, a critical factor in someone determining your suitability for a particular role or uh, mission. 
So when a disaster emergency hits, there's rarely any provision for critical personnel to bring their family, um, to bring their family with them. Your family needs to completely understand their role in the survival of you, their them, their family, uh, and their team or your unit, whatever you're in. And also, to a carefully measured degree, your role and what they can expect to do when called, expect you to do when called into action. So it's better to have an idea of what we're preparing for, at least a range of situations, rather than to gather a backpack full of cool stuff and leave it to chance or become overwhelmed with possibilities. So this is where we define the mission. Okay, so what is the mission? Earlier in the definitely not slide, we decided that it was better to be able to survive and, and be well positioned for continued survival and or a successful recovery than to just survive. In this slide, what we're asking, what we're asking is, is we need to further define the mission. We need to break that mission down into, into logical, tangible, accomplishable steps. Goals will vary from person to person, but most will focus on the survival of the living, resources, habitation, sustenance, etc., and purpose or their functions. In a larger perspective, which is good to keep in the back of our minds, but not necessarily to determine our starting point and direction, we want to continue to exercise our freedom in everything pertaining to it. All right, let's take a short detour into the nature of preparedness efforts. Okay, so when? <clears throat> What's important now? But the question in a statement. For an individual with no other teams, divisions, managers, organizations competing for resources, the answer or response can be comfortably arrived at. In a business or corporate setting, however, the best forum for deciding when or what's important now is having department or team leads or, or company leads or co-leads uh, band together and approach the issues with the goal of meeting priorities, which are life, property, product, and mission. All right, a cycle with a, within a cycle. Let's talk about that. Here's an image that I think kind of represents what we're, what I'm talking about, or at least what I'm thinking about. See, if you if you start in the middle, you have to navigate a small space and reach a definite conclusion, which is one of your exits here, <clears throat> that moves you outward into a larger, more complicated space uh, that has dead ends and more turns. In some cycles, the path out of necessity takes you on a circuitous route that needs to touch certain areas. And conversely, you'll stay away from others just to get to the next ring. And being unfamiliar with this process, it can look daunting at first with the possible outcomes uncertain. And like I said, this is how I picture you know, the road to preparedness in my head. Each decision and success leads to more decisions, successes, and failures. So if you try to picture each facet and step in your efforts, it, it may look like this. At first, the decision tree is simple. Then it gets a little more complicated. And then a little more complicated, and sometimes it can seem nearly impossible. All right, but let's get back on track. What are we preparing for? What are you preparing for? If we think about the direction we want to go, the question should come up. What are we preparing for? Is this the end of the world as we know it? Is this a global emergency? Is it geographically contained to a particular continent? Does it span the boundaries of a nation? Maybe it's confined to your state. It could be at the local level. Uh, it might just be your neighborhood that's experiencing the problem. Or it could be just your home. Maybe the emergency exists within your family. Or maybe it's the world falling in on just you. So hopefully up to now, you've seen the reasoning and need for preparedness and have probably answered the question when or what's important now a few times. Right? This is where paper and pen come in handy. So how do others accomplish this process? I have a couple of... Um, couple of links on this slide here. One of them is the, uh, is the Are You Ready PDF. That's the first link. And the second link is the Continuity Guidance Circular, or the CGC. Um, so although this material presented by FEMA is it, especially the Are You Ready PDF, it's a little dated, but it's still a good place to start. Now, now and what we're trying to offer here is a condensed version directed at individuals, families, and teams, and small organizations. And we're trying to walk you through some of the some of the larger points in this process so that you don't have to wade through the volumes of sometimes conflicting information that you might find at FEMA. So where do I start? 
Every journey has its beginning, and once you've decided your goal, which is probably along the lines of, I want my family and I to survive and live comfortably and safely as a start, all you'll need to figure out is the mission requirements to accomplish that goal. All right, take a look at what FEMA's outline looks like. This is what you'll find inside FEMA's Are You Ready pamphlet. Okay, to be fair, it is an accurate representation of some of the preparations for an emergency. For organizations and small businesses, this is a good place for your personnel to start. After all, you can't be prepared enough, right? Uh, and you can't be a prepared organization without prepared personnel, right? So in this guide, in my guide here, we'll touch on FEMA's information, but I'll have much more information that I'll, I've pulled in from other perspectives and experiences that aren't elaborated on by FEMA. I'll make the process quick, quick to start and easy to understand without all the big government confusion concerning requirements. In addressing FEMA's plan, okay, so getting informed, this is taking stock of where you are, what you have, and how proficient you are with your processes and systems. Emergency planning and checklist, a simplified threat and hazardous incident and risk assessment, which is THIRA, T-H-I-R-A, helping you to identify what you probably already know about your area. It helps to determine the greatest risk and threat, which helps you to plan for the most likely event. Assemble and disaster supplies, supply kit, so it's a handy but far from complete checklist that we'll discuss and add to later. Shelter uh, concerns alternate locations and hazard specific preparedness. Again, using the most likely scenarios and creating multi-use plans and resources. The practice and maintaining your plan, testing, training, and exercise. That's what this is about, all right? TTNE. That's what other agencies go through. Developing methods to determine your readiness posture. So as I said earlier, it's a good starting point. The material and the material from FEMA and sites like ready.org are there to take you from the beginning to end and then you start again. However, a lot of the higher level material is geared towards government agencies and the standards that have been implemented at the classified and higher tiers. All right, in this slide, we need to determine the most necessary things and processes we need to accomplish our stated goal. In this case, Staying alive requires food, water, and shelter at a minimum. Everyday life is just a system of cycles and various functions. From the simple to the complete, and some are absolutely essential to living, some are not essential. To accomplish most functions, certain resources are necessary, like money or a place to call home, one that you have functional control over. A farm can be a resource also, but when we get to the level of farming, the process of farming, has its own absolutely necessary functions, without which the farm would be useless. At the federal level, each agency has at least one primary mission essential function, which differs according to the purpose of the agency. We would all agree that food, water, and shelter are absolutely nece necessary to survive, and these are of primary importance, so the goal cannot be accomplished if these three things do not happen. <clears throat> all three are needed. We're going to call them top-level priorities, or our primary missions. So to accomplish our goal, staying alive, the missions or activities that need to happen that are necessary to stay alive are having food, water, and shelter. Okay, um, <clears throat> Getting, storing, packing, and preparing food is not done in one step. Neither is getting, purifying, storing, transporting, packaging, or consuming water. Shelter is a process also. As an example, using the mission of having enough food to eat and survive, several functions must occur. Food must be obtained in one way or another. In emergency preparedness, food is prepared in several ways. Some food is made to be ready to consume immediately or on the go. Some is made to be canned or dried, to be packed for future use. And this requires a method of getting the food and getting to the point where we'll have, well, we will have it with us and have the ability to eat it. In short, this typically requires money, a bartering system or a farm. So while money can be the method of accomplishing the food mission, it is useful for many other things, not just getting food. So we would say that having money is one of those primary resources that enables us to do the functions that are essential to the primary mission, such as eating. So we'll call the requirement and process of obtaining food a primary mission essential function. Okay, It's a function that's so important in supporting the mission that the goal cannot be accomplished without it. That's probably the shortest way of saying it right there. Extrapolating this, the requirement for water is also a primary mission essential function. So a shelter. So we'll refer to these highest level priorities as PMEFs, P-M-E-Fs. Okay, and in just a minute, we'll discuss the lesser prioritized tasks such as EFs, essential functions and essential supporting actions. 
So no, ma so no matter where you start, all paths in the emergency preparedness um, activities, they all lead to continuity, all right? Uh, there's a saying, after the boom, or after the beep, as some people say, <clears throat> after the boom is post-event, what happens afterwards? Um, all of our emergency preparedness efforts are for the sole purpose of getting back to normal. And so continuity is the key. Continuity is the overarching concept that all efforts are geared towards remaining functional during and after a catastrophic event, bringing the affected community or nation back to normal and maintaining a free, functional, and properly operating nation. Here, uh, where we at August, mid-August of, of 2020, uh, we're going to see how continuity works. Um, we'll see how how functional this is. This is a uh, very severe and very important test of uh, the nation's continuity preparedness. And uh, this last statement here for the federal government, this goal is called an, an enduring constitutional government or ECG. That right there is, is what's being put to test right now. Okay, so if you put your desire to be prepared for a disaster in context, you'll find that the end of the plan is usually you and your loved ones sitting comfortably on a deck, drinking coffee and watching the sun rise on a new day, or set on a particularly bad day. So we're safe again, right? So nearly every disaster movie, zombie apocalypse, TV series, or world-threatening alien invasion ends with, or at least has as its hope, a new and peaceful day, or at least the end of a bad day or the bad guy. The federal government has looked far enough forward to understand that the effort and money being expended right now need to pursue the goal of enabling all who are left after the disaster to rebuild the United States of America, our way of life, and the freedoms and rights that come with it. If you plan correctly and use discretion in your decisions on what and when to prepare, you can ensure that those that follow you will have the best chance of living in a free country. Now, I was a Homeland Security unit, unit Supervisor for my police department. I was all about having all the right equipment, implementing the best training, and preparing all of the other response unit and the citizens of the city. Okay. I had our equipment closet, our storage area, organized, prepared, and labeled. So one procedure that my department and many others did not have in place was that of redundancy in personnel and making sure that there were seconds in place. You know, another person who knows what equipment is where and how to make sure that everything is operational and ready just in case I can't be there. So I left a detailed note hanging from the door hydraulic arm so that it would almost smack someone in the face when they opened the door. It said, basically, the equipment you need is in the black bags on the shelf to your right. The keys to the large cabinet in the garage are hanging on the wall to your left. Okay. Extra masks, canisters, and other equipment are on the shelf in the back. Okay. Take the attached detail instruction memo from me with you as well as the key that's taped to it. There's a concealed cache of equipment just outside the city in case you cannot return. Here's my phone number if the networks are still functioning. Good luck. Continuity. Everyone can benefit from the continuity concepts and principles. Organizations and small businesses will benefit from the whole picture of continuity. The Federal Continuity Directives, FCD 1 and 2, and the Continuity Guidance Circular are full of details. Sometimes the prospect of beginning a cycle is a little daunting because the starting point is sort of vague. For continuity specifically, and emergency preparedness in general, the planning phase is usually a good starting place. It's like trying to jump on a merry-go-round while it's spinning, hoping you pick the right spot jump at the right time, find something to hold on to, and then once you're on, you realize you might fall off real quick. Once you start moving in the right direction of being prepared, whether you're an individual or a company or maybe a church, you'll start running into others that have been in the cycle for a little while. And you'll find others that are starting at the same time as you are. Some are a little ahead of you, some are a little behind. The nice part about jumping into the cycle is that no matter where you pick up, you'll always learn something. For businesses and organizations, take a look at the FEMA links on the slide. Um, the, the FCD 1 and 2 outlines the federal government's requirements for certain categories of businesses. These would be the federal branches, the executive, legislative, and judicial, and the supporting interagency members. For smaller organizations that do not directly support the federal government or the interagency, the concepts and principles are solid even in the smaller scale. 
If you focus on the items that seem to apply to you and your organization, you can hardly go wrong. What we're going to focus on in this short course is the, are the four basic principles okay, or pillars of continuity and what they mean. So pillar number one, leadership. In the federal government, this pillar relates to the structure and function of agency leadership and helps to coordinate the executive functions within the operational sections and everything in between. At the individual family group and small business level, this can be as simple as identifying someone who wants to or gets voluntold to take the steering wheel and start making decisions on the direction and depth of the preparedness process and processes and efforts. The leadership principles can also help to identify roles for multiple levels of management in an organization. Pillar number two, staff. For the feds, this addresses the structure of the organization, including redundancy, staffing formats, and shift, uh, responsibilities and compartmentalization of information, personal and individual readiness requirements, and emergency assignment of personnel to devolution and relocation groups, and that's a new term. Uh, at the individual and smaller uh, organizational level, this would help to identify a logistical division of responsibilities okay, and help managers identify staffing needs for planning, continuity, locations, and resources. So pillar number three, facilities. The federal government maintains alternate locations everywhere. There are jurisdictions in and around Washington, D.C. and other areas that have no idea why many of their office buildings are mostly unoccupied. For the most part, this is why. For the individual, family, and team, this will be where you identify the safe zone in the house for a tornado or maybe identify a hotel you can reserve ahead of time in case a hurricane headed your way strikes or your in-law's lake house that they never use when the zombie apocalypse strikes. For the small business or organization or maybe church, for example, this may be the unused second floor of a partner business to house your administrative staff or an agreement with your city to use two rooms of the community center for your disaster support operations or the banquet hall of the American Legion to use for services once or twice a week. Today's business venues with a growing online component are finding the virtual meeting rooms and platforms adequate forms for their customers and clients. And finally, pillar number four, communications. Communications methods, method, messages, classifications, and security will be primary concerns as your plans grow. Uh, for the feds, communications or comms, security is of utmost importance. If your comms are classified in nature, take a lesson learned okay, um, at the highest levels. Uh, know and understand your communication networks from, from device to delivery method to distributor to owner to owner affiliations. A small cellular data provider that wins a government contract may have some nefarious ties that are not immediately apparent and won't cause any issues at first. But when an increased need for security and reliability meet during a hurricane or a cyber attack, the little details like foreign investors in a comms company can have big consequences. For the individual, family, and team, communications issues will likely center around cell phone connectivity not counting solar flares and genuinely accidental outages, disruptions due to intentional acts and the impacts of world events happen more often than is thought. On 9-11, with most cellular services being in the 2G spectrum, it was merely minutes into the day that cell services were overwhelmed. In today's environment, most cell services can support a surge of users, but texting seems to be most reliable, for now. This is why an alternate communications method, more than likely centered on digital services, will be needed. What other digital methods are there other than cellular? Landline phone services, although outdated, are still serviceable and are, and are valuable. Some internet providers that, that provide their services over wire are offering landline phone and fax services as options. And depending on your stability and resources, a fax machine can be used to send messages and uses minimal bandwidth. Thinking out of the box and from a perspective of post-disaster environment, my earlier example of leaving a note behind for whoever it is that comes after me can be applied to the individual, family, and team situations. Having a predetermined sign on the outside of the location, such as a red spray-painted arrow pointing in a certain direction or con a condition, such as if the location is totally destroyed, to indicate, to the re uh, indicate the rest of your team is moved on to one of your alternate locations. Redundancy, how to structure redundancy. 
The idea of not having a choke point or a bottleneck for an operation, especially a critical operation, uh, or having one person that can accomplish one critical task. We don't want there to be one person in charge of the critical life-saving procedure who happens to get sick or not come to work that day. Okay, so the U.S. military uses a redundancy model known as PACE, or at least they used to. Uh, P-A-C-E, which stands for Primary, Alternate, Contingency, and Emergency. And this can be applied to nearly every aspect of your resources. Okay, it can apply to your route, your communications modes, uh, to just about anything once you pick up on the concept. In this case, we'll, we'll use the location of operations. All right, so primary, your primary location. This could be your headquarters or your primary place of operations. The administrative offices may have their primary location at the company HQ, and the primary location for the operations division, on the other hand, might be in another building or another state. It's a place where 100% or close to of your functions occur 100% of the time. And this is where people get lost in the weeds. You may have several primary sites or several alternate primary sites. Just think of it as simply the best to the worst. A, alternate. The next usable place where you can provide nearly 100% of your functions nearly 100% of the time. It's like sleeping on your couch. All right, you may have more than one alternate site, and the best ones are determined by different factors. Again, best to worst. C, contingency. It's like your in-law's house. You don't really want to be there, but you have to. You have degraded functions and a great degraded time frame. E, emergency. Minimal functionality and provides essentials such as food, shelter, and protection. It's like being at a friend's house. Someone else takes care of the functions. When choosing your options according to the PACE model, things we want to talk about and look at are things like location, all right? Other categories that can be incorporated in the PACE model are things like go bags and weapons, uh, communications, transportation, just about every resource that you're going to use. Unless you're a government agency or wealthy enough to have extra facilities, you know, just laying around, when it comes to relocation, you'll likely have to go with sites that are already established to some degree. You start with listing all of the locations that you know you can land at and be welcomed into, and if need be, stay a while, to put simply. Uh, then you filter those locations by their properties, such as security, occupancy, available resources, and factors such as distance and time, mode and route of travel, and other factors. So keep the PACE model in mind for all of your preparations. Emergency preparedness can be broken down into two broad categories, individual and group. By group, I mean family, team, organization, business. And for the in, these are further broken down into functional categories. So for the individual, there's the physical, mental, spiritual, and communications um, categories, so the functions. As, and for both the individual and group categories, there's a common function, which is resources. We'll get into the group. Uh, we'll separate out the group functions here in a little bit. So there's many as, there are as many ways of preparing for an emergency as there are people in the world. The following categories uh, are by no means complete or exhaustive. However, in the context of who will be conducting the emergency preparedness activities and who will be the ones implementing the, the, and using the resources to survive, the major differences are largely defined by the size of the group. Communications is listed out separately for both the individual and the group categories because individuals can, but not always, have different requirements or needs, uh, communication needs than groups. Also, there are major differences in how individuals prepare as compared to a small business or an organization. Each has different, different requirements and needs. This list, as it lands on your computer or notepad, should be growing and changing the moment you read the slides. So one category of emergency preparedness is physical preparedness. What we're talking about here is health, strength, endurance, uh, your skill sets and your proficiencies. What are you good at? What are you not good at? What do you need to work on? You know, what have you worked on already? What are you proficient in? Also, you can carry this a little further and think about what can you instruct others in? What can you help others in? And that's what I think the... Um, you know, the internet or this, uh, you know, or, or some of these, um, you know, YouTube, that's what I think that platform is for. Teach others, help others get through these things, okay? So when we talk about health, we're talking, we mean you have to stay as healthy as you possibly can if you're going to survive. Strength, you need to have the ability to perform work or somehow have that work performed for you. Work smarter, not harder. 
endurance, you may have to evacuate the city or wherever you're at. If you remember the images from 9-11, all those people having to walk across that bridge. Okay, It took people hours and some it took days to get home and unfortunately some never made it home. Skill sets and proficiencies. Um, these will degrade no matter how good you were uh, a little while ago or yesterday. Although I promote the idea of having the right gear, you should be able to use the right gear. This means getting it out of the box, using it, wearing it, adjusting it, returning it if necessary, and trying something else. Don't make the assumption that it's going to work right out of the box. Uh, a weapon is a good example uh, here. So know how it works. If you use it for hunting, go hunting or practice with the highest degree of realism you can. If you saw something cool on YouTube that's supposed to save your life in the middle of the ocean, you need to make sure you practice it in the ocean if you can. If not, go to the beach. If you can't go to the beach, go to the pool. Make sure you can employ or the method or deploy the gear with confidence and under pressure. And try to do it in a degraded state. You know, use one hand, you, you know, close your eyes while you're using it. You know, use only your feet to tread water, things like that. Uh, because the, your, your condition, the conditions that you will be in when you're using emergency gear is not, they're not going to be optimal. Another category is mental preparedness. We're talking about knowledge, adaptability, discipline, and that's outlook and perspective also. So when it comes to knowledge, as you develop your mission, your functions, and your needs, you need to make a list of the things that you need to research or look into to be able to function successfully. Being able to adapt. Right? The PACE model applies here as well. Develop the ability to adapt to the problem. When considering gear, location, weapons, food, or etc., ask yourself, how can I accomplish the same function without this? We just talked about that. All right? Discipline. This is mental and physical discipline. Challenge yourself at every possible point. Uh, be able to take yourself just a little further than you went before. And so here's something to try. At the end of a, if when you take a shower, at the end of your shower, turn the water temperature down just a little bit and make yourself stand still or stand there in the water for 10 to 15 seconds, a, a minute, or whatever time frame you, you want to challenge yourself for. Then at the end of that time frame, turn it down a little bit more and tell yourself you're going to stay there for at least that time frame. Okay, and when you can't stand it, anymore, finish out the, the time frame that you set for yourself, however long you did, and then turn the water off. Okay, it's a good challenge. It's a good mental challenge. Part of mental discipline is adopting or developing or promoting an outlook or, and perspective concerning common survival, uh, common continuity, or common recovery plan. If there's more than one person in your group, you, you need to make sure that everyone has the same mission in mind. You don't want that Hollywood rogue member scenario happening halfway down the road. All right, another category, spiritual preparedness, okay? This has, this has, has uh, broad applications here. So your spiritual connections, um, those things that you look to to get you through hard times, uh, constitution, okay, your morality, your conscience, and your character. All these, uh, I believe, or, or I've applied here under spiritual preparedness. Okay, so this, this pertains to the individual. Uh, this pertains to the individual, generally where most people where it draw inner peace and mental fortitude from. It can act like a compass when dealing with raw and abrasive situations involving serious injury, loss, and death. Your constitution is how you behave when the going gets tough. All right, so your, your morality, conscience, and character all come out of your constitution and your, your disposition, as well as how you were raised. And these things affect the larger group, the larger group decisions when uh, when when an individual is involved in, in a group setting. All right. The second broad category of emergency preparedness is the group, family, team, or organization. So these this category uh, has all the categories for the individual, as well as resources, and. Uh, we, we'll talk about group and individual responsibilities, group dynamics, cohesiveness, a negative discipline for the group, uh, growth, attrition, and separation of the group, and resource, and resource accumulation and distribution. When you're establishing the goals and missions of a group, large or small, if the effort has been put forth in the beginning concerning the goals and mission, it will be infinitely easier later on when it comes to assigning roles and responsibilities to people in the group or team. 
So TT&E, so training, testing, and exercising your plans, processes, and resources helps to develop in a safe training environment good group dynamics with everyone learning along the way and with little to no pressure from the outside world and, and the threat of death by failure. Training and exercising your plans will also help to establish and cement the goal and mission for the group. Remember, if you train like you fight, you'll fight like you trained. Discipline, negative discipline. Uh, the movie uh, the movie Red Dawn uh, has, has some, not that I subscribe to Hollywood for, for implementing real world training, but it has a good approach on, uh, on discipline for the group there. No one wants to be called out for mistakes or worse, negligent or criminal activity. This is where the investment in training and exercise comes in. The survival of the group is dependent upon the positive and contributory actions by everyone in the group. However, there will need to be an established structure for discipline up to and including ejection from the group or worse. So growth, growth of the group, attrition and separation. Resources should be distributed and allocated to those that need or can use them and to keep some items separate from others. You don't want all of your food in one vehicle for obvious reasons. Your training and procedures will need to cover what happens to resources in the case of attrition uh, or the loss of personnel. Who gets the shotgun? And in separation, this has several meanings. Who's in charge? What's, what is the plan? How does the mission change when the group is separated? On the other hand, what happens if a subset of the group wants to go another direction? You know, what about the group's resources? When we talk about resource accumulation and dis distribution, as the group progresses through the event, how are new resources allocated to personnel? Who gets first choice of weapons? If there is a distribution method, method what is it? Is it fair? Does everyone agree with it? All right, categories, resources. So resources apply to both individual and group preparedness. Um, they both have different, re, uh, the same and different resources and different needs. Uh, some, of the, some of the categories here are financial, currency. What is the current currency? What are we using to purchase things? What's the highest value item right now? Is it toilet paper? Um, when it comes to real estate, when it comes to real estate, we're talking about a real place, a location, someplace that you might control. Now, on the other side of having real estate or a location or a home base or a place to operate from, which might get compromised, you know, uh, in, in continuity, you, you have to plan to move somewhere else. A um, someone might adopt a, a nomadic uh, lifestyle, meaning constantly on the move, which which makes which inherently makes you pack lighter. Um, you move constantly. Yes, you don't have a permanent place. Uh, security can become an issue, but uh, somebody on the move is hard to hit uh, or hard to take advantage of. There's, uh, there's pluses and minuses to, to both uh, ways of thinking. All right. So when we're talking about um, leveraging resources, these are resources that are highly valued and can be bartered, can be bartered with like uh, sustaining resources, which are food, shelter, and protection, finances, and creature comfort. When we talk about security, we're talking about offensive and defensive, um, everyday carry stuff on the on the lighter side. Um, we also talk about tools and weapons, improvised and otherwise. Uh, we talk about uh, bags, meaning go bags, bug out bags, um, you know, get home bags, you know, end of the world bags, three day bags things like that. And we talk about knowledge, skills, and abilities, and the distribution of those things, the distribution of our, of our uh, EDC, the distribution of our EDC items, uh, our tools and weapons. Where are we putting our bags? You know, should we have a bag stored at, at our office? That's always a good idea. Um, should we have something in our car? Um, and when we talk about everyday carry, we all, uh, which is another series, we talk about packed and prioritized resources. We talk further about bags and just a short note on bags. Depending on your resources, you're going to want to start with probably a go bag, a get out bag, something that will get you from where you're at right now and get you at least out of the danger zone. Okay, This should be packed with what you deem to be essential items for your immediate survival. It should always be packed, maintained, updated, and cycled. All right, and that's another series. Under ideal circumstances and in a perfect world, neither of which exists in emergency, uh, which is what we are preparing for, it would be nice and James Bondish to have a bag for every occasion. 
So if we get this premise out of the way from the start, uh, we have to think if you have the ability and resources, you'll need you'll probably need several bags for different purposes. Second, you'll most likely scale the contact contents of your bags in size and cost. And last, you'll probably want to move items from bag to bag as needed, making the assumption to begin with. Make, you, know, you need to make that assumption to begin with. All right, so let's say you have five of the best bags. All right, with all the best gear, each as light as it can possibly be, one for civil disturbances, one for natural disasters, one for on water or in the air, one for in the wilderness, and one for a military or alien invasion. One bag will be perfect for one mission, but not another. Of course, we get into redundancy and cost issues, and this is where multifunctional or, or shared resources become invaluable. And so it helps to partner up. All right, just make sure you pick the right partners. On behalf of Blue Horse uh, Threat Mitigation Strategies, I want to thank you for, for taking the time to watch this course. I hope this provided something for you that you needed or something maybe you didn't know you needed and something you learned. Uh, if, you have any, if you have any input or responses or criticisms, please uh, email me. Uh, you'll see that on, on the first page at the top of this. Uh, but the other courses that, that we'll be putting up are packing a go bag, responding to an active shooter incident, church security practices, and home, home security tips and others. Again, I'm Robert, and I thank you very much for watching.